Welcome to Netbook Study. This is the daily current affairs analysis of 5th September 2024. Here in this video, we are going to discuss the important news articles from Hindu newspaper as well as Indian Express. Along with that, previous years questions are also going to be discussed. Let's get into the discussion of this. The first article is regarding pension and uh, here in this article it has been mentioned that EPF, EPFO it has given a green signal to the CCP. CCPS stands for Centralized Pension Payment System. And what is the CCPS Centralized Pension Payment System? As of now, uh, if a person, uh, especially old pension scheme, if they have enrolled to the old pension scheme system and if they are getting pension and there is a restriction, they, they can collect pension in a particular branch from a particular bank. And also there is a verification process and the person himself or herself she has to go to the bank and she has to get the pension amount this is one thing and the second thing is once in a while they have to go there and they have to verify that they are alive and even these kind of verifications have to be done in a regular interview see uh, if a person is settled in some other city or if they have relocated to some other city then it would be very difficult especially if a, a, a person the pension oriented person or the, the wife of a person who is getting this pension if they are 80 plus then it will be very difficult to visit the branch physically and also to come for verification re-verification again and again it is very difficult and even if we want the transfer to the another branch then also it is very difficult the process is very difficult for the transfer of this pension account so the it was time and again a lot of complaints were coming to the epfo a lot of the complaints were even government was also receiving a lot of complaints regarding these particular very strict procedures stringent procedure with respect to pension process in our country now epfo has come up with a centralized pension payment scheme under this ccps it would be easier there is a you can easily withdraw your pension money from any branch you can transfer it to the any bank so the transferring to a different bank transferring to the different branch also it is easy and it uh, the main objective here is that the modernization the it modernization of epfo it is going on so under this process of modernization even this pension procedure has also been simplified and this is one thing and another news that is mentioned in this news article is sites 2.01 right sites 2.0 you can remember it as and what are the sites central don't confused with this endangered species this sites is different centralized it enabled system so epfo epfo is employees provident fund organization and the modernization of EPO, epfo it is going on so under this there is one program site that is centralized it enabled systems so this is going to be implemented from 2025 so under this procedure the new pension scheme of ccps it is going to be implemented so uh, this is what the ministry the epfo it comes under the ministry of uh, sorry union labor ministry so union labor ministry he has given explanation on this by doing this there are around 70 lakh pensioners in our country and these pensioners they are going to get advantage and another thing is this uh, central pension payment scheme this is going this comes under the employee pension scheme of 1995 and one more information piece of information is other enabled service are also going to be uh, inculcated right? it's also going to be added to the pension scheme of 1995 so this is the content of this news article uh, let's talk about epfo also epfo i told you that this uh, the main objective of epo is regarding the social security social security of the employees who are working under the government agencies and this this is a statutory body and this is established under employee provident fund and miscellaneous provisions act of 1952 so 1952 employee provident fund act uh, led formation of epfo and it works under the ministry of in, uh, labor and employment and there are three major schemes are there under epfo the first is epfo 19 scheme 1952 then comes pension scheme 1995 and this article the ccps also comes under the pension scheme of 1995 and the third is insurance scheme of 1976 these are the three major schemes of epfo and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2017 
This is regarding national pension scheme and let's see there are four statements and you need to find the right statement. The first statement, resident India, Indian citizens only, even people of uh, Indian origin, sorry not Indian origin, NRIs, non-resident Indians, they can also enroll for national pension scheme and the person's age, it is from 21 to 40 years. Here it has been mentioned as a 55 years. And the third statement, all state government employees joining the services after the date of notification by respective state government, this is true. So seek the right option. And finally, fourth, all, all central government employees, including those armed forces. See, armed forces, they still uh, follow the old pension scheme. So they does not come under the national pension scheme system. So only uh, seize the right option here, seize the answer. And let's move to the next news. The next news is regarding Brunei. The Prime Minister Modi, he is visiting the Brunei two day visit. So, here what we are going to do is the first thing the bilateral, the MOUs we have signed with Brunei that is going to discuss the content of this news article, it is going to be discussed. And the second aspect, I am going to give the background information, the bilateral information between India and Brunei that is also going to be covered here. So, let's uh, see the content of this news article. If you look at the headlines, the main aspect is China. So, in the entire uh, visit by Prime Minister Modi to Brunei, there are two aspects. The first aspect is re with respect to the hydrocarbons. And the second aspect is with respect to China. China, you can mention it as a security perspective. These are the two main discussions held between India and Brunei here. And what exactly the news article is talking about? Prime Minister Modi he is visiting a Brunei Dar es Salaam and is the official two day visit. And this is the first time the Indian Prime Minister is visiting the Brunei here. And Prime Minister Modi here he has visited, he has inaugurated the High Commission of India in Brunei and also he has visited the Omar Ali Saifuddin Mosque. He has he, uh, visited the mosque also. And a joint working group is, it is going to be established, especially with respect to the defense. To increase the defense ties and this defense ties mainly linked to the security it may it is mainly linked to the china threat in that asean region in the south china sea region so that's the furthest uh, thing and uh, apart from all these things there were bilateral uh, discussions were there and uh, we see uh, even we are improvising our relationship now it has become an enhanced partnership between India and Brunei. And we have done MOU, Memorandum of Understandings, especially in the key areas like defense, trade, investment, space, health, education. These are very generalistic. The, all I would suggest is the main focus with respect to Brunei here is the hydrocarbon, especially LNG, liquefied nitrogen gas. This was the focus. And then comes the China factor. These are the two factors, uh, the major discussion factor between India and Brunei here. And also we are aiming to increase our uh, trade relationship also. For that, uh, there will be platforms like joint trade committees. And uh, let me give you guys background information regarding India-Brunei relationship also. See, India, we have a act east policy and for this act east policy ASEAN plays very very important role and in that ASEAN Brunei is also an important factor here very important player here so we are increasing our engagement with ASEAN countries in that engagement in that engagement of act east policy engagement Brunei plays very very important for India's uh, role in the ASEAN country but if you look at the trade perspective the economic relationships it's not very good with Brunei but now we are taking step we are making sure that the integration the financial integration is going to happen between India and Brunei as of now it is only around 300 million dollars it is 286 million dollars it's very less but now uh, a lot of agreements have been done in various sectors most probably uh, within three four years our trade it's going to see a drastic change and brunei's uh, see the important aspect is brunei has one among the largest oil and gas producer one among the the region which has a very strong oil and uh, gas reserves so india want to take advantage of this for oil actually now we are focusing on russia 
so oil we are not much focused on brunei but gas yes lng liquefied natu natural gas india is focusing on brunei and we are dealing we are signing agreements with brunei for the the trade bet uh, between india and brunei with respect to the liquefied natural gas and currently there are 14000 indians who are residing in brunei who are working in brunei and they are, they are giving their contribution to the Br brunei economic development also and uh, as of now i told you that uh, education healthcare space sector from all these sectors also it's going on and uh, in 2018 the see brunei has a longest serving monarch sultan bolkai and he visited as a chief guest in during the republic day parade so this is the relationship between india and brunei on the whole there is nothing significant the things you need to remember is act east policy and the thing is there is a potential is a trade and then uh, oil and gas trading so these are the things you need to focus and also the diaspora who are giving their contribution to the brunei economy and let's see the question previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2016 the first uh, the question is evaluate the economic and strategic dimensions of india's look east policy in the context of post cold war international scenario and let's see previous yeah that is done let's move to the next topic the next topic is regarding international labor organization and what is the news ilo it has released a report and in this report it has mentioned that the artificial intelligence it is in it, it is directly affecting the labor income so let's focus on it the what is the uh, name of the report that is world employment social outlook and this is released by ILO international labor organization and in this uh, international labor organization uh, one aspect has been mentioned that is labor income it is declining labor income declining and what is the reason reason is artificial intelligence see what exactly it is happening is artificial intelligence it is increasing the productivity it's fine companies are happy but the thing is at the same time it is reducing the uh, human power or the human resource to do the same work because everything is automated with the artificial intelligence it is saving the time to the companies and it is saving the human resource to uh, de uh, to do a particular task so one side artificial intelligence it is helping the industry and the second time second way it is impacting the employment it is impacting the labor income so this report is talking about it see uh, ultimately the report is giving a suggestion that see we need a productivity better productivity we need better technology all these things are fine but there should be a balance balance between what between technology between the employment and the labor income that balance we should find a solution for it and the more these companies start implementing these private entrepreneurs uh, they start implementing this artificial intelligence it is going to be very difficult with respect to employment opportunities and this is what this article is talking about and also it is also mentioned that uh, even the sdj goals the sustainable developmental goals even that is also progress is also not up to the mark and another aspect the COVID-19, this has drastically changed that labor market in the world. So we are seeing the decline and uh, we are seeing the reduction. So that aspect also been mentioned in this report. See, these kind of reports, even yesterday we had a discussion regarding World Bank report. It's very difficult to remember all these reports, but just keep it in mind that artificial intelligence, it is in, uh, these kind of points, artificial intelligence, it is impacting the labor income. You can mention these points in a uh, indirect way in your main answers also. But if you ask me whether these kind of reports, every 10 days once there will be one report from one international organization. So, uh, human it is impossible even uh, to remember all these reports and also content of this report just understand the concept just go through with the, the what exactly the report is pointing out that would be sufficient let me give you guys background information regarding ilo also international labor organization this is one among the united nations specialized agency and this was established in 1990 see 1919 after the end of a first world war we had a league of nations at the same time, uh, uh, League of Nations, this ILO also been established under the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War. And uh, but later on, what happened after the formulation of UNO? This ILO has become a specialized agency under United Nations organization. At this point of time, there are 187 member countries, 
and what is the objective of this as the name indicates labor organization this set is the international standards for labor and uh, and also if a, a particular country is ratifying they also set these kind of standards with respect to their domestic market also and another important aspect is these standards are not binding these are non binding standards so this is the basic information and another important aspect you need to remember from exam perspective is that there are eight core conventions under ilo the first two conventions are with respect to forced labor there are two conventions and then the wage there are two conventions with respect to wage that is equal remuneration convention and discrimination employment uh, convention then comes there are two conventions with respect to child labor the first it is forced labor then comes child labor there are two conventions and there are two conventions with respect to association trade association the india has ratified uh, forced labor child labor and wage uh, the equality of wages but it has not ratified this association formulation of trade uh, the associations uh, for the labors so uh, i think this would be sufficient from exam perspective let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2018 international labor organization conventions 138 182 are related to and directly goes to the answer it is with respect to the child labor see that year in 2018 this was in the news that is the reason this question has been asked but out of usually out of the blue these kind of question usually the upsc avoid so see it's impossible to remember all these things if it is in news if it's uh, in some kind of uh, conference is going on ilo then you need to dig deeper or else it's fine just have a basic understanding and let's move ahead and let's see the next article the next article is regarding kaveri river issue and also the authority the kaveri river water authority that has been formulated this article is talking about it what exactly the news is talking about it's from crisis to the cascade of hope so the news article is see whenever there is a proper rainfall then there is no issue between karnataka and tamil nadu with respect to river water kaveri river water sharing because there is an excess amount of water and karnataka does not mind uh, sharing that with the tamil nadu so it's fine but when the rainfall is less when the rainfall is low then that is the year of contention that becomes very big issue between tamil nadu and karnataka and we are seeing these kind of issues from almost two three decades we are seeing it once in a while these kind of things happen now uh, in 2007 the kaveri water dispute tribunal it gave a final award but both the karnataka and tamil nadu they were not happy with that they went to the supreme court and finally supreme court also uphold this uh, kaveri water dispute with minute changes it's, they did some changes ultimately uh, supreme court also supported the tribunal uh, award with respect to water sharing formula so this is fine see this year rainfall is good there is no issue uh, no problem from karnataka to release water and no problem from tamil nadu side also since they are receiving the river water this is fine in article the detailed amount of how many tmcs have been gone usually water every month there should be minimum 30 tmcs of water should be uh, released to tamil nadu these kind of minute details have been mentioned see that thing the, these kind of technical details you don't need it only focus on those concept oriented uh, cons uh, details here so let's focus on that one here a data has been mentioned and what is this data from the year of 1995 to 2024 you can take it on 1994 to 2024 it's a data of 30 years and in the data of 30 years 11 times there were issue between india sorry karnataka and tamil nadu with respect to river water sharing it means that every three years once both the state they are finding a, they are having this river water sharing it's a very difficult uh, process for them it see i told you that whenever the rainfall is fine it's good both the states they are happy but when the rainfall rainfall is scanty when the rainfall is very low then karnataka it is not happy releasing the water and tamil Nadu demands more water so this kind of tussle that happens and every once in three years even the data also shows that this kind of tussle these kind of uh, issues that is that is cropping up so 
it is difficult see whatever the final award the tribunal has given it is very difficult to follow this also so during this time of distress how do you handle this so in order to handle during this time of distress the Kaveri Water Management Authority, it plays very important role. And in order to help the Water the, uh, Management Authority, we have a one more body, Kaveri Water Regulation Committee. So this helps uh, CW Authority. The committee helps the Water Authority, Kaveri Water Management Authority to deal with that issue. And if there is a rainfall, it is fine. During the distress year, this is very difficult. In that during the stressful year, this management authority, Kaveri Water Management Authority, this plays very, very important role. But see, now you don't, the Karnataka does not have that authority to uh, reject whatever this uh, authority says. And even Tamil Nadu also have to follow it. But even after the decision given by uh, this management authority, both the states are not happy. So for that, some suggestions have been given by author that how to deal these kind of distress kind uh, distress issues and also how to pacify both Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. There are three suggestions have been given. The first and foremost suggestion. See, whatever the decision taken by this uh, Kaveri Water Management Authority, this should be transparent. Everything should be written. Now, everything, uh, uh, nobody outside of, they don't even get to know that on what basis the decisions have been taken and what are the decisions also. So, there is absolutely no transparency in the working. That should be changed, both authority as well as the committee. They should change the working. They should uh, make their working approachable to public and they should also make sure that whatever the decision they take everything should be in writing so this is first suggestion and the second suggestion is that the vacancy in the Kaveri water management authority is this is a problem and your author is telling that whenever the uh, vacancy happens it is the responsibility of central government they have to fill the vacancy especially the, especially the ministry of jal shakti they have to fill the vacancy this is the second suggestion the Third suggestion is, see, if you look at this Kaveri Water Management Authority, all the members, they are officials. See, IAS officers, other state PCS officers, these officials are there. See, uh, officials, they have their rules, regulations, they usually stick on to that. They don't uh, take risk or they don't go beyond that. But we need extra minds, we need uh, different solutions also for these kind of problems and how do you find a different solution the different solution is that we need environmentalist and we need independent experts also who have the experience managing river water if these people enter the management authority they would be they would be in a situation to find a better solution here you are just following the rule book you are just following the legal the uh, the laws whatever rules are there but we need a different approach when these kind of distress situation happens for that we need environmentalists we need independent experts on the river water issue so these are the three suggestions having your first is transparency should be maintained second is vacancy should be filled and the third is experts should be there rather than officials these are the three suggestions and let's move ahead and let me give you guys background information regarding kaveri water dispute also see kaveri water it uh, originates from Karna in Karnataka and it moves and it uh, enters Tamil Nadu and finally it reaches the Bay of Bengal. See the dispute, when did the dispute started? Here if you look at the stakeholder, there are four states, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka and Puducherry. Puducherry is union territory, three states and one union territory. And when did the dispute originated? It started in 1892. See at that point of time, it is the Madras president residency it was under the control of british and the mysore state and this was under the control of odayas see at that point of time the mysore state they wanted to build a dam they wanted to use the recovery water river they wanted to build a dam but britishers they were ruling the they were controlling the entire indian subcontinent and they were since they were ruling the madras they convinced uh, mysore state that uh, mysore princely state at that point of time that the 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 Madras presidency, it is dependent on river Kaveri water, especially agriculture in that region. So you cannot abruptly change the arrangement. See, if you want to build a dam, but the, there should be some kind of discussion should be there and in, even the level should be discussed and uh, 
the water level and what how much water can be stored everything the discussion should happen then only you could go ahead so dispute started in 1892 when princely state of mysore started building a dam they started the proposal but later in 1924 after few years finally agreement has been done and what is the agreement the madras presidency they agreed to build the dam the krs dam krishna nagar sagar dam they agreed that but some of the restrictions have been placed that you cannot increase the agricultural land and even the water usage should be this much only you cannot increase the level uh, uh, dam water storage level all these kind of restrictions were there so this agreement was signed in 1924 and this agreement was for 50 years so in 1974 the agreement ended so this agreement was binding on karnataka in 1974 agreement ended after 74 what happened the karnataka state government they start building other dams small small dams for the tributaries and they started uh, a developing canal system also so now the uh, tamil nadu it is not happy that the karnataka is telling that legally we have that authority 50 years we followed this now we uh, we are done with this agreement and we are developing the irrigation facility for the farmers of karnataka but the case it went to the supreme court and since the inter state disputes supreme court it is not the original jurisdiction so tribunal has been formulated the tribunal is kaveri water dispute tribunal this tribunal was formed in the year of 1990 and case was the hearing was going on finally after 17 years in 2007 tribunal gave the final award that how exactly the water sharing should be so under the tribunal award tamil nadu should go get 419 tmc karnataka get 270 tmc kerala 30 and the puducherry 7 tmc this was the final award again both the states they were not happy they approached the supreme court a uh, supreme court they made that minute changes and they upheld the whatever the kaveri tribunal awarded and also supreme court uh, told that it has declared the kaveri water as a national asset and another thing is uh, it has constituted the one body kaveri water management authority the objective of this kaveri water management authority is whatever the tribunal award has been given the implementation is under the control of this water management authority so it is a national asset kaveri river is a, and this ma- management authority it is going to handle the river water sharing before that it was under the control of karnataka government only so the dam was controlled by them only so you, what karnataka government used to do was they used to release water to their farmers and uh, they used to tell that we don't have uh, river water especially in the year of distress this used to happen and tamil nadu again it used to go to the supreme court it used to get the injection so these kind of thing used to happen now entire control comes under the water management authority and they are going to even during the distress years even when the year the rainfall is not proper this water management authority they take the decision that how much water should be released to tamil nadu and let's see previous year question on this particular topic question was asked in 2013 constitutional mechanism to resolve interstate water disputes have failed to address and solve the problems is the failure due to structural or process inadequacy or both discuss and let's move to the next article the next article is regarding great nicobar project and what is the news article here let's see the news article what do we know about a n i i d c o and uh, the news is regarding great nicobar project here and to implement this project there is one corporation that is andaman nicobar andaman nicobar island integration developmental corporation see this corporation this was established in the year of 1988 only under the company act but now the great nicobar project the implementation factor is in the hands of this particular corporation now see the great nicobar project i'll give the detailed explanation see under the great nicobar project central government is spending 72000 crore and this 72000 crores will be spent on the uh, there will be a trans shipment port there will be a airport and there will be township see these kind of infrastructure it is going to be developed in the great nicobar island and uh, and in order to develop all these infrastructural project this particular ani ani idc that andaman nicobar in island integrated development corporation they have the authority now the question is with respect to this see the when this particular body has been framed the main objective is that 
there should be a development along with that there should be environment protection also there should be that balance between development and environment protection this is the intention but the issue here is if you look at the main activity of this particular corporation it deals with the trading of petroleum products it deals with the uh, trading of foreign made liquor milk and managing tourism resort infrastructure development fisheries all these things but where is this environment aspect when you formed this particular body you talked about environmental friendly development now where is that provision of protecting environment where is that provision of environmental friendly development this is the question mark see this great nikoba project it has been uh, questioned by environmentalists what see environmentalists ngos the civil society organization they are telling that this ecosystem of andaman nikobar it's very vulnerable and by developing all this infrastructure you are affecting the andaman and nikobar uh, uh, this ecosystem then and also the tribal people who are living there so they're not not happy with this project and they have, even the petitions have been filed in the supreme court also to scrap this project but the government of india it is going ahead with the project here now the argument is that this particular corporation this is going to balance the infrastructure as well as the development now in this article it has been questioned that how do you balance it what are the provisions and what power this uh, corporation has to protect the environment these questions have been asked so this is the content of this news article but let me give you guys background information regarding this great nicobar project great nicobar you know that andaman nicobar and in the nicobar one among the island is great nicobar island and in this great nicobar island we are developing the infrastructure project and this infrastructure projects we have a we are going to have a airport we are going to have a township and the trans shipment terminal and also power plant these are going to be there see there are two main uh, objective behind this the one aspect is economic aspect economic aspect this is going to support the tourism related activities in that region and the second aspect is security aspect especially the presence of china it is increased increasing in that bay of bengal region it is increasing in the malacca strait region so you, even in order to counter the chinese presence we need uh, indian navy and indian air force presence in that region so in order to develop infrastructure to help the security perspective also this great nikoba project helps a lot so from both economic perspective as well as the security perspective this plays very important role and the name of this project is holistic development of great Nic nikobar island project here and uh, this uh, see uh, the i told you that port will be uh, built airport will be built the port will be controlled by indian navy and the airport there will be a dual control dual control both by military as well as the civil uh, even military functions also carried out in that civilian functions also uh, going to be carried out in that airport and along with that roads public transport water uh, supply waste management facilities hotels tourist facilities everything is going to be built under this nikobar project so this is it for this news article and let's see previously a question on this particular topic in 2014 this question was asked which one of the following pairs of islands is separated from each other by 10 degree channel answer is very simple it is andaman and nicobar i think this is it for the day guys yes this pdf is available in a netbook study telegram channel please like the video subscribe to the channel subscribe to the telegram channel also i'll see you guys tomorrow with current affairs have a good time